All right, welcome to a new, what's going to be either a let's play or a let's look at, it just depends. Um, this is Stars in Shadow. Let's go ahead and jump right into the new game. And I picked this up after watching Daz Tactic play it on his channel, and it was over vacation. They had a big update, and uh, anyway, it looks like it's supposed to be kind of a successor to Master of Orion 2. And that's kind of what won me over, as well as his gameplay. It was kind of on my radar a little bit when Master of Orion had its big release back in uh, fall. And some of you mentioned it to me. And uh, I've been watching it on Daz's channel and kind of was getting impatient, wanting him to release more <laughs> episodes, but he was releasing like one every other day. One came out just today. So I decided, what the hell, I'll do it also at the risk of you know, imitating his own content, but imitation is a form of flattery, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and besides, I want a science fiction game on my channel now, and yeah, this is a good one. Um, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it. I've been playing it a bit off camera to figure it out. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Um, space dinosaurs, expert in carrier warfare, rebuilding on the frontier, but with ambitions of ancient empire, and that's the Ashtar Colonials. Yeah, thank you. Let's just keep it real. They are space dinosaurs. Um, so uh, all of these races have different uh, little bonuses that they come with. Uh, let's see, these guys get a plus one for uh, generate plus one production. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, so like, for example, this is every one million units counts as like basically one regular pop if you play like Master of Orion or something. And so for every one million units, or 1 million population, I believe it is, on a planet, you'll get this bonus just flat out on the planet. And then a scientist perk, they get plus five. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Plus five on construction, is that right? Anyway, so uh, the plus one industry means that most normal races will get two construction instead of, uh, two industry construction instead of uh, three. And then they get a special nice uh, carrier spaceship, so fighter technology would be a good one for them. Uh, the Imperials have this kind of warp gate, which is interesting, so they start out being able to instantly warp within their system. And uh, they just have plus five science, period, as well as they get 1.5 money per million pop instead of the regular one. So, And they have a medium hive world, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, there is a story to the game. I'm only going to read the story for the race that I end up picking. Uh, the Fiddy, they can uh, recruit mercenary ships. That's their thing. That's the race that Daz is playing on his channel. And uh, they generate plus one uh, attacks, so they get two. So the Imperials got 1.5, these guys get two. And a bonus research to sociology. Um, humanity is really a cool one, but I saw that a lot of people were playing humanity anyway. And, uh, yeah, warning, you may have difficulty early going, and it's not recommended for first-time players. They are really cool, though, and so, yeah, like, you don't start with a home world. You have a space station, and from there you have to go out with your two colony ships and transports and find a place to live. So I really like them. Like, if it weren't that I feel like a lot of people are playing humans by default, I would definitely pick this race. But as they say, it does mean you kind of have a luck on your start. Uh, the uh, random generation of the galaxy can really make it make your life miserable if it goes badly. So uh, next is the Yorl Cognate, and uh, these are the guys I've been playing off camera, and uh, these guys are really good. I like them a lot. Uh, they start on medium glacier world. That's fine. They get the plus one industry just like the Ashtar Colonials. They get a bonus to planetology, and the other great thing about them is they can colonize just about everywhere like if you look at any planet the yorl are like number two as far as have like um preferred habitability so they can live everywhere and uh these advanced destroyers as well if you're like me and you like spaceships these are awesome too like they just get these extra chases that can hold uh other weapons and i just really think they're cool yeah i love these guys if you like to colonize planets and build up population like i do this is a good race uh, the Orthon Conference, uh, these guys are interesting, so plus 0.5 science, so compared to the others, like 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5,
0.5. These guys get one per million, and uh, they get a bonus in the physics uh, research, and they start with an ice ball homeworld, and you can see their homeworld change down here, right? These are pretty unique, too, the glacier worlds, the ice ball. I haven't run into very many of them, although you run into barrens and such. Uh, island, right? And uh, next we have the Gramac, Gramac or Gramac. I don't know. I'm going to probably say Gramac. Empire. And uh, slimy, raiding, conniving slave masters who would like to have you for dinner. I mean, over for dinner. So they start on a medium swamp planet. And uh, they evolved in sweltering wetlands of the planet Gremal and reproduced by laying large numbers of eggs and leaving them largely unattended to fend for themselves. Development through their various life stages to adulthood is long and treacherous, with many being killed, eaten, often by other Gremek, or enslaved. Those who do survive through hard work, clever integration, or absolute vicious cunning eventually mature into the large, powerful adult Gremek who are typically as courtly and diplomatic as they are ruthless and ambitious. The Grimac are ruled by a hereditary aristocracy, but their internal politics are dog-eat-dog, dog, literally. Wouldn't it be snake-eat-snake, snake, literally? Uh, like the Ashtar, the Grimac were participants in the Great War that ended the ancient Golden Age and suffered badly in its aftermath, the orbital bombardment of Gremal nearly exterminating all life there. Ever persistent, the Grimac have survived and rebuilt and managed to retain a few of the technological secrets of their ancestors, including concealing distortion fields and powerful short-range energy torpedoes. In addition to the vessels of the Gramac Imperial Fleet, one may also encounter ships in the infamous red and yellow war paint of the Marauders. I have. I've met them. They're annoying. These renegades exist on the fringes of the Gramac Empire, raiding neighboring aliens for slaves and plunder. The Gramac Imperial government maintains that the Marauders are an outlaw faction, but it is a poorly kept secret that the destination for Marauder-taken slaves is often the edges of the Gramac aristocracy. So that's pretty cool. I think basically that means that these two independent pirate factions uh, support your main empire if you play the Gremac? We're going to find out, because this is the race I'm going to play. I like their spaceships. They're pretty cool. Not exactly my play style, uh, stealth, but we're going to give it a shot. So you, you go in stealthy and then unload with your short-range energy weapons. Uh, as far as colony colonists go, they're not the greatest, so we will probably be enslaving as many other populations as we can and keep our Gremacs for ourselves. So, let's go on to map settings. I will try to explain the game as best I can as we go. Uh, I was talking to the developer on Steam today with some questions about uh, the game that came up during my previous... Uh, or, or on my off-camera playthrough, and, and I, I feel a little bit more comfortable with the uh, mechanics, but he kind of copped to the fact that... Uh, <laughs> the the mechanics of the game are still also a little bit up in the air over on their end, uh, going through revision and so forth. So um, everything's subject to change. And uh, what I say in this video may not stay true uh, throughout the course of the game, and I think probably will change based on what I, I said. So let's see, we got seven different factions. I put them all in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, normal star system will be fine. I'm going to keep star density as normal. Now, here's the thing. Uh, small, whoops, normal and huge just affects the number of stars. Now, the size is going to be determined also by the number of stars because there's a density. So that means that at a certain density, stars are going to have a certain average distance between them. So obviously, more stars, more distance, bigger galaxy. However, star density will also modify that. So if you go with a dense star density, your overall galaxy size for the same number of stars is going to shrink because the stars all get crammed together a little bit, so less area, right? And if you and likewise if you go sparse, it's going to get a lot bigger. So if you want a huge star or a huge galaxy, then I guess you would go sparse and huge. Now, I'm not going to do that because it means that your spaceship's going to take forever to get around places. I'm also not going to do dense either. I'm going to do normal. And I don't want this many starting stars because I want the game to kind of get going. Right. I don't want it to last forever based on kind of what I was experiencing with my last game. Um, this may kind of skew the game in favor of certain races I'm afraid but we'll find out so again let's go back and put in everybody so Fiddy 
uh, let's see, Orthan, or as I think of them, the space lice, because they look like wood lice. Look like really pulleys. Uh, the Yorl, which I think are going to be tough, and Humanity, who were the first ones to die in my last off-camera playthrough. Uh, those are the only options. I don't know if random is random exclusive or not. Um, I, whoops, I hope so, but I don't know. If not, I hope that they make that a uh, condition or something that you can like click and be like all random are unique or something like that, unless you have like, you know, a billion of them. Um, so yeah, let's do 40 stars. Uh, that's a little bit less than normal. Uh, native races, I'm going to keep that as rare. Habitable planets, I'm also going to keep as rare. The native races are really cool, but, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. hmm, all right. Well, we only have cho the choice between rare and abundant, so, ah, eh, let's keep it rare. Let's just get things, we got seven of our main races in the game, so. There are other races, and that's re what's really cool about the game, and, uh, like, minor faction races, and that, and so there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens there. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Star density plus number of stars equals overall galaxy map size. Okay, we're going for it. Generating new galaxy. I'll say something about the art style. Overall, I like the art style. It's just this one font here that I don't like. Uh, the art style is described as kind of being cartoony, and I don't have really a problem with it, except this font. I don't like this font. It's a little bit like, I don't know, Comic Sans-y feeling. It's like kind of cheeky. All right, we are ready to explore the stars. Greeting and felicitations, O oh wise and terrible emperor. I am Baron Velik the Cunning, and I will be serving as your senior military assistant. Uh, we will. We have just completed the trials of our first warp-capable starships. Uh, we don't know what to expect out there. Our scout is lightly armored. Uh, you can direct our colony ship to settle on Osada, the frozen third planet in our own star system, or you may prefer to wait to see if our scout can find a more hospitable target for colonization out in the stellar neighborhood. It is time for us to establish the interstellar dominion that is our destiny as Gremak. Happy hunting, my lord. Okay. Close. So here we are, our star system is Sabak, and what's kind of confusing is that our planet is Gremal. Oh, look at this, we have, huh, Servile, 2 production, 0.5, these guys here actually, uh, where do they, enslaved colonists lose all research and production? Um, Experiment. Enfi slaves cannot be liberated. Subject slaves to scientific experiments for one time 40. This is new to me. Using slaves as test subjects will reduce slave morale and fitness for work. Forced labor. Overwork the slaves for a one time 100 production boost. Forced labor will reduce the slave morale and fitness for work. Okay. The Enfi are diminutive marsupial-like species native to Gramak's homeworld, and the Enfi formed an important element of the workforce. Yeah. So here's the thing: is these Enfi probably are one and 0.5 like any other race? A servile, been slaves for so many generations, they cannot be. They cannot conceive of any other way of life and so cannot be liberated they will also never revolt regardless of their morale well that's good oh we can enslave our own people <laughs> um that's interesting so next let's go ahead and look at the planets here because this is kind of important our population is 6 million of 16 million okay and it is composed of swamp and ocean biomes now if we click on the swamp biome we will see that the number one uh population, like the population type that is best suited for swamps and thus can reach the highest population in a swamp is us, the Gremak. Uh, and the Enth Enfi are number two. So the Enfi, if we took all of our Gremak off the planet, what would happen is the maximum population of this planet would drop because the Enfi would only be able to populate a number two amount <laughs> I don't know how better to say it I don't know what the actual numbers are a number two amount of the surface whereas the Gramac because they're much better suited could really pack themselves in there into every nook and cranny 
Uh, next, we have uh, back ocean. Now, if you look here, uh, the Gremak are not bad with ocean. They can live there. And the Enfi are also number three. So again, uh, we'd lose population, a max population, if all of our Gremak suddenly disappeared off the planet, we'd lose a max population because the Enfi were not suited for either swamp or ocean. The general rule of thumb, as, dis as explained to me by the developers, is that the more population you add to a planet, basically the higher the max population should go. There's nothing that would lower the maximum population. Like, if nothing, it should stay the same. Like, if we had another race that had the same stats as the Gremak, then nothing would change because there's no extra swamp areas that are suddenly colonizable by this new population. I hope that makes sense. We're going to see this come into play in practice. So, anyway... Uh, our growth rate is high, our base growth rate is high, and growth rate is determined by things like city planning and happiness and things like that. So, alright, that's going to be the planet screen for now. Uh, we have some... oh, wow, this is not a big galaxy at all. Okay, well, that'll be interesting. Um, we have a scout cruiser. These yellow stars are going to be our best bet for... This uh, circle here is not part of the default. Um, is not part of the default view. What you need to do to activate it is go into your options, and uh, where is it? Not tactical grid. Not that. Show range circles. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So you can turn that on to see the range circles of your. Uh, Empire, so you can always see where you can get to. And uh, our scouts have a special item in their... Whoops. Okay, let's just go to... We just made a factory. Let's go to Grandma. Uh, our scouts have a special... A special... Bloody blue. It's a scout cruiser, really? That's interesting. Oh, no, no, no. That's not it. What... Where's our scout? What? Is that a scout? Really? That's a scout cruiser? Oh, wow. Okay. They have a special little thingy here. A warp lane amplifier, which increases the ship's strategic range by one parsec, so it can go a little bit extra far. I think what I would prefer is... We don't have access to frigates, huh? That's interesting. We do have destroyers um yeah a scout cruiser that's interesting huh so if you look at these two ships you might be thinking oh well you just have two cruisers one's a light cruiser and one's a scout cruiser no that is not the case these should be two different chases entirely so if we go into our light cruiser you'll see we have a missile turret I mean a missile spot four turrets three systems an armor spot and a uh, built-in engine slot okay but if we go into our scout missile four turrets three system maybe it is the same hmm interesting but if we go down here to oh maybe we can make a new ship design oh that's interesting I guess we can okay oh, well never mind I was totally wrong let's try it out let's say we don't want to make expensive light cruisers and we want to just go with a exploration destroyer i hope the music's not too loud i'll fix it if it is in the next episode so put on a viper launcher uh let's put in a warp thingy uh we need a reactor don't we yes uh now actually let's not put in anything and what else do we need maneuvering warp plane blah 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 Do we not have long-range scanners? Hang on a sec. Let's take a look at you. Deep space scanner. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to our production. No, we don't want to make that. Light cruiser, scout cruiser, edit design, turret... Deep space scanner, right? Okay. 
So why can't our destroyer use it? It just can't. Oh, because it doesn't have a turret. That's why. Do we need the deep space scanner for any reason, though? Tell me. Uh, designed to gather information on a range interstellar phenomenon. These scanners are a vital tool in many scientific missions. I don't know that that matters. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to make a new destroyer. And we're just going to call it a scout. Whoops. Scout. Uh, we need a nuclear reactor. And we probably want to have a warp plane amplifier. Okay. Metal 98, cost 114. We're done. Okay. Exit out of there. And we have 100 metal right now. Let's go ahead and make a scout, I guess. We can always retrofit this and fix it up. So, ah, it's going to take five turns to make it. Hmm. Marauder Raiders. Oh, what are these guys? Oh, you can make raiders, apparently. Interesting. Okay, we're going to find out all about that in the future. I have our scout heading out. What else have we got? A regular transport. Embark colonists. Uh, I would like to embark colonists, but yeah, let's go ahead and do that. We can send one of those. Uh, we're we're going to wait. We're going to wait. We want to populate something somewhere first. I'm not going to send my colony ship just yet. Click on our fleet, take our transport, I will be disappointed if we lose our transport, but uh, we're going to do it anyway, just because we want to find a place we can habitat, habitate that we can live in. Okay, yeah, we got three in range. That's good. So go there. Make a scout. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, mineral rich. That's great. Um, yeah, that's good. Space stations, what these do is they have a construction module, which means they're going to be capable of uh, make, making bigger ships like the colony ship. So, all right, that's it. Let's go to our next turn. Uh, oh, we have to pick our research. So we get two research points from Grandma. Uh, Viper Dynamics, what's this going to do? Significantly increases the range, costs 800. Okay, Guidance Systems cost 80. So... It goes in order here from more expensive to least expensive, and then everything you have is down here. Now, one of our special things is, well, slave callers for one. That's something that um, I haven't seen before. I don't know that the other races even get it. Uh, same as Marauder weaponry and uh, anything else that lets us build, I'm not sure. Uh, distortion field, this is accessible to everybody, but we get it way early and it only costs 200. Now, there is a tech tree, but you can't see it at the moment. What happens is you have to go through these links here. So, like, this leads to heavy missiles and prerequisites, etc. Anything that's in white you don't have yet. So, like, you can click around like that. Um, I would like to have a map to see kind of everything so I can make long-term goals and stuff like that. Whereas right now you kind of have to click around blindly. Not blind, but you have like a limited vision to like these hyperlinks, right? Uh, right. What do we want to start out with? Uh, everything, like I said, gets more expensive the further down we go. Guidance systems gives us nuclear missiles and extra munitions. Uh, let's see. They're good. I'm not going to say they aren't good, but... Uh, what do we have already? Uh, metallurgy, we have lasers. Okay, star drive, that just lets us fly around, I think. Uh, superconductors is a popular one, I believe. Hmm, man, our research is terrible. I think we will... Boarding tactics is neat. Uh, gives the ship ability to do boarding actions. That's just taking over ships if you get into that. Leads to hover tanks and defense grid, though. That's important. Um, small craft are going to be our fighters. Artificial organisms. 
uh, improves our farms. That's also very important. Rapid fire lasers, also good. You know, I really don't know what to take. Um, I would say let's not think about it too much, though. And let's see. I don't think these are going to be that helpful for me because our craft are all about getting close as possible. So let's start with boarding tactics. Uh, unlocks the component, the science station. That could also be useful. Uh, alien psychology. Hmm, boy. I want to go either xenology. Uh, rapid fire lasers aren't bad. Uh, superconductors. Viper dynamics. Field plasma. Hmm. Well, let's just pick one now. So, we're going to go... What was I going to say? Nope. What was I looking at again? Small craft. Oh, yeah, boarding tactics. There we go. 150. It's not that expensive. We'll go for that at first. Sabic. Again, Sabic. Is this really what we want you to do? Versus... We have a farm, a factory, and a mine. Hmm. We could definitely use the research as the thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's take a minute while I let that simmer in the back of my mind and look at how structures work. Okay, so we, have a, we start out with a mine, a farm, and a factory. Now, what mines do is they extract minerals which go up here and make your well minerals and you need these to actually build stuff so then your factories take this and produce using the wrenches so if you look at your things here you have two costs here you have your wrench which is like your labor that's just like raw labor that's necessary and then you have the raw materials that are required so if you look at colonizing, like to colonize your neighbor planet once you have something in a solar system. That's another important thing to know too, is we do have a colony ship. We could have just colonized here, but since we already have a colony in this system, uh, we could build a colony directly, like just on this planet. And it works basically the same way as the colony base did in Mu2. And that is a much better way to do it. Cause if you look at it, your colony ship has a labor of 634 and a material cost of 56. So it's gonna take nearly twice as long to build a colony ship and then drop your colony ship off in the same solar system as it would to just build a colony base so to speak or do the colonize osada project so yeah this is much better because it's in our solar system we don't need a warp drive to get all the way over there you know what i mean so i really like this mechanic a lot and it's one that's missing in the Mu reboot that was present in Mu 2 and i liked it a lot better in Mu 2 uh, we're not going to do it yet. That's 380. So, yeah. This cost here, this is how much production labor will get done, and then you need to have this much uh, raw materials to build the actual thing. Now, next. Uh, and now mines are what actually do that. Now, a mine... Um, basically, one mine will produce six raw materials per turn, and... Let's see, here we can see our total output. So based on building this scout ship, we have a minus 21 raw material cost per turn offsetting the six production costs. So that's why we have a total of minus one, right? So, or I mean a total of minus 15. And as long as we have enough reserves, that's not gonna be a problem. But once we get to a reserve of zero, then our construction stops. So that's how the mines work. Uh, we do not want to get rid of it. Next we have our farm. And here's where things get a little bit more interesting slash confusing. So this is kind of a general overall colony overview, not for this specific farm. That's something that kind of confused me a little bit. So Grimmel is a swamp world, question, question, question mark. Uh, it has one farm which produces four food. The farm is fully staffed. Building an additional farm would increase production by plus four. Okay, now here we have uh, citizen contribution. NP slaves are contributing one food and the Gremak are contributing two food. Now the reason for that is we have four million Gremak, which counts as four of the six population here. So if you want to know how this number relates to this number down here, basically divide by a million. Okay, so these guys, as you can see, 
0.05 food per million population means that they generate two, and these guys 0.5 food per million population means they contribute one. And therefore, empty slaves give us one food, Grimac give us two food. And so that is a total of three. So that's the three food here, plus the four food from the farm. Because that's not, that wasn't clear to me the first time. I was like, huh, what are these numbers coming from? Minus six is the amount that's being eaten for our total population. So each million of these guys eat one food it means we have a food surplus of one, which does not carry over the way uh, raw materials do. That gets used up and then the food spoils per turn. Okay. Now, here's the concept of fully staffed in just a minute. Let's go ahead and look at our factory. Okay, factories make industry and they uh, provide a boost to production. Uh, to get the maximum benefit, you need a world with at least four units population per factory. Now, what that's referring to is this fully staffed concept. So, if we look down here, Grimmel has one factory which produces 12 uh, labor in industry force, workforce, I don't know. Um, production that's the word the factory is fully staffed now that's because we have one factory and we have over four units of total population uh, let's see building an additional factory would increase production by plus 11 okay so I think that's because we don't have 8 million right so if we built another factory and we wanted it to be fully staffed we would need to have eight units of population, one unit of population again being one million colonists. Okay, we don't have that. So that popu that factory would not be completely utilized and we would only get the plus 11, I wanna say. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I could instantly build the factory, I could tell you the answer to that. But that's what happens is to get 100% output from my factory, I need to have at least eight population, right? Or units of population per factory so obviously what happens is we have a planet here that has 16 max population that means if we go over four factories we're not going to get maximum efficiency from the factory it's going to not it won't be fully staffed and uh, the production will go down now the next thing you might be wondering is and I'm going to click on the fully staffed link here well then what about the farm doesn't the farm need uh, Let's see, fully staffed. Doesn't the farm also need staff, right? And so here's the overlay for it, right? So you need one population per mine. You need two population per farm to keep it working at 100%. You need three per lab, four per market, and four per factory, okay? But as it says here, they do not compete when applying their staffing requirements. So that, so for example, a world with three factories and four research will suffer no production penalties on a 12 population world. And that's because uh, with three research stations, you would need, uh, or I'm sorry, with four research stations, you would need three colonists to fully staff all four of them, and that would be 12 colonists. And you might be like, oh, well, that was all 12 of my population. There's none left over on a 12 population world. And what it's saying here is, no, 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 that's not the case. Uh, that just means that you would need, um, that just means that you have enough for four research stations and three factories. But if, for example, your, your world here uh, obviously only had seven slots, let's assume. This one here has six. Um, that means if you built, for example, instead of the three factories, you filled up these slots with seven research stations. That would be seven times three is 21. And on a 12 population world, you're not going to get your full um, utilization there. Okay, so I know that's been a bit slow and just starting out here on the first episode, but I hope that this explains the core mechanics. If you have questions, let me know, or it's explained in the Steam forums. I hope it makes sense. Again, like I said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, exit out of here. And yeah, like I said, um, we're going to go ahead and make our scout and just see how that works for us okay like it is on hard difficulty but i think we'll be fine it's not gonna be a killer mistake if it turns out i didn't want that scout and you can always refit your ships later so yeah no problem there as far as i'm concerned that's gonna do it for this episode uh i hope that that again like i said explains the core game mechanics a little bit we'll get into combat and stuff like that later and uh yeah join me in the next episode and we'll get down to uh we're gonna get the rubber to hit the road Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.